Chapter 6 Clerval then put the following letter into my hands. It was from my own Elizabeth. My dearest cousin, you have been ill, very ill, and even the constant letters of dear kind Henry are not sufficient to reassure me on your account. You are forbidden to write, to hold a pen, yet one word from you, dear Victor, is necessary to calm our apprehensions. For a long time I have thought that each post would bring this line, and my persuasions have restrained my uncle from undertaking a journey to Ingolstadt. I have prevented his encountering the inconveniences and perhaps dangers of so long a journey, yet how often have I regretted not being able to perform it myself. I figure to myself that the task of attending on your sickbed has devolved on some mercenary old nurse who could never guess your wishes nor minister to them with the care and affection of your poor cousin. Yet... That is now over. Clerval writes that you indeed are getting better. I eagerly hope that you will confirm this intelligence soon in your own handwriting. Get well and return to us. You will find a happy, cheerful home and friends who love you dearly. Your father's health is vigorous, and he asks but to see you, but to be assured that you are well, and not a care will ever cloud his benevolent countenance. How pleased you would be to remark the improvement of our earnest. He is now sixteen and full of activity and spirit. He is desirous to be a true Swiss and to enter into foreign service, but we cannot part with him, at least until his elder brother returns to us. My uncle is not pleased with the idea of a military career in a distant country, but Ernest never had your powers of application. He looks upon study as an odious fetter. His time is spent in the open air, climbing the hills or rowing on the lake. I fear that he will become an idler unless we yield the point and permit him to enter on the profession which he has selected. Little alteration except the growth of our dear children has taken place since you left us. The blue lake and snow-clad mountains they never change, and I think our placid home and our contended hearts are regulated by the same immutable laws. My trifling occupations have taken up my time and amuse me, and I am rewarded for any exertions by seeing none but happy, kind faces around me. Since you left us, but one change has taken place in our little household. Do you remember on what occasion Justine Moritz entered our family? Probably you do not. I will relate her history, therefore, in a few words. Madame Moritz, her mother, was a widow with four children, of whom Justine was the third. This girl had always been the favourite of her father, but through a strange perversity her mother could not endure her, and after the death of Monsieur Moritz, treated her very ill. My aunt observed this, and when Justine was twelve years of age, prevailed on her mother to allow her to live at our house. The republican institutions of our country have produced simpler and happier manners than those which prevail in the great monarchies that surround it. Hence, there is less distinction between the several classes of its inhabitants and the lower orders, being neither so poor nor so despised, their manners are more refined and moral. A servant in Geneva does not mean the same thing as a servant in France and England. Justine thus received in our family. 
learned the duties of a servant, a condition which, in our fortunate country, does not include the idea of ignorance and the sacrifice of the dignity of a human being. Justine, you may remember, was a great favourite of yours, and I recollect you once remarked that if you were in an ill humour, one glance from Justine could dissipate it for the same reason that Ariosto gives concerning the beauty of Angelica. She looked so frank-hearted and happy. My aunt conceived a great attachment for her, by which she was induced to give her an education superior to that which she had at first intended. This benefit was fully repaid Justine was the most grateful little creature in the world. I do not mean that she made any professions, I never heard one pass her lips, but you could see by her eyes that she almost adored her protectress. Although her disposition was gay and in many respects inconsiderate, yet she paid the greatest attention to every gesture of my aunt. She thought her the model of all excellence and endeavoured to imitate her phraseology and manners, so that even now she often reminds me of her. When my dearest aunt died, everyone was too much occupied in their own grief to notice poor Justine, who had attended her during her illness with the most anxious affection. Poor Justine was very ill, but other trials were reserved for her. One by one her brothers and sister died, and her mother, with the exception of her neglected daughter, was left childless. The conscience of the woman was troubled. She began to think that the death of her favourites was a judgment from heaven to chastise her partiality. She was a Roman Catholic, and I believe her confessor confirmed the idea which she had conceived. Accordingly, a few months after your departure for Ingolstadt, Justine was called home by her repentant mother. Poor girl, she wept when she quitted our house. She was much altered since the death of my aunt. Grief had given softness and a winning mildness to her manners, which had before been remarkable for vivacity. Nor was her residence at her mother's house of a nature to restore her gaiety. The poor woman was very vacillating in her repentance. She sometimes begged Justine to forgive her unkindness, but much oftener accused her of having caused the deaths of her brothers and sister. Perpetual fretting at length threw Madame Moritz into a decline which at first increased her irritability, but she is now at peace forever. She died on the first approach of cold weather at the beginning of this last winter. Justine has just returned to us, and I assure you I love her tenderly. She is very clever and gentle and extremely pretty. As I mentioned before, her mien and her expression continually remind me of my dear aunt. I must say also a few words to you, my dear cousin, of little darling William. I wish you could see him. He is very tall of his age, with sweet, laughing blue eyes, dark eyelashes, and curling hair. When he smiles, two little dimples appear on each cheek, which are rosy with health. He has already had one or two little wives, but Louisa Biron is his favourite, a pretty little girl of five years of age. Now, dear Victor, I dare say you wish to be indulged in a little gossip concerning the good people of Geneva. 
The pretty Miss Mansfield has already received the congratulatory visits on her approaching marriage with a young Englishman, John Melbourne Esquire. Her ugly sister Manon married Monsieur Duvillard, the rich banker, last autumn. Your favorite schoolfellow, Louis Manoir, has suffered several misfortunes since the departure of Clerval from Geneva, but he has already recovered his spirits and is reported to be on the point of marrying a lively, pretty Frenchwoman, Madame Tavernier. She is a widow and much older than, than Manoir, but she is very much admired and a favorite with everybody. I have written myself into better spirits, dear cousin, but my anxiety returns upon me as I conclude. Write, dearest Victor, one line, one word will be a blessing to us. Ten thousand thanks to Henry for his kindness, his affection and his many letters. We are sincerely grateful. Adieu, my cousin. Take care of yourself and I entreat you, Right. Elizabeth Lavenza, Geneva, March the 18th, 1700. So I will stop for today and continue with this chapter next time. Bye-bye.